Hey everybody, it's William Lally and welcome back to Talking Flair Networks. And I'm here with my sidekick, mentor and polymath and very good friend, uh, Carl Wagner. Before we get into breaking news that's happened this mid-February of 2024, and boy, there's a lot of it. I just want to make a statement here about if you've gone to our YouTube channel and you've seen some commercials pop up and things like that, Carl and I don't have any sponsors. We're not sponsored in any way. We don't make money from these podcasts deliberately. We're just here to talk about the tech. And that's what we like. Just wanted to make it clear. When you see a commercial or something pops up, buy this, do that. Uh, man, I got nothing to do with that stuff. And, and neither does Carl. And, and he can make a statement on that if he wants just for himself. But we don't have sponsors. So there you go. Okay, pressing on. There was an announcement about a week or so ago by Citibank. And I know it's referred to as Citi, but to me, Citi is Citibank. And to be clear, I, I want to use the term Citibank. Citibank announced that it got into an experimental test of asset tokenization with a variety of other entities, and they were really successful and very proud of this successful test. The entities they got involved with was mainly Wellington Management, Wisdom Tree, the Avalanche, Ava Labs, and the big gorilla, DTCC's digital asset section. Now, DTCC is the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation. They clear and settle billions of dollars daily in trades, in equities, in transactions. They are a huge, big gorilla in the traditional financial world. So in these test cases, they did end-to-end -end token transfers. They did secondary transfers. They did uh, experiments with collateralized lending all kinds of things running on the Avalanche Spruce uh, Evergreen testnet. These were very successful for Citi, and they went uh, public with their announcement. Now, where they go from here uh, hasn't been announced, but I, I just want us to focus on that tech that they're experimenting with and have been successful in doing. The reason for that is we have to back up several months, actually a year or so, to understand where some of this is going. JP Morgan announced about a year ago improvements as banking services called multi-currency notional pooling. So JP Morgan has the JPM coin. It's a coin that they can program, manipulate. It's semi-open source, but it's definitely a walled garden. It's something they ultimately control on the inside. It's been recognized by the World Bank as a as a player for a global transfer of wealth, uh, et cetera. So JPM began to use this new banking service of multi-currency notional pooling to address the needs of multinational corporations. So I encourage people to Google these terms. What is a multinational corporation? That's one of these multi-billion dollar corporations that have both tangible and intangible assets spread out all over the world so they can have their own internal supply chains and deal with their clients and customers. For example, DuPont has a chemical factory in India. They've got chemical factories in Ohio, in Japan, all spread out all over the world. And so when they have to move money or debt instruments, financial instruments from one place to another, JP Morgan is offering this service where the multi currencies owned by a multinational are notionally pooled as like an internal stablecoin. And then it becomes very easy to move huge amounts of wealth, debt instruments, contracts, you name it, and assets from one place to another seamlessly. Now, this what was a tremendous technological breakthrough for me when I began to understand how this thing was working. Because let's roll back the magic clock a little bit more on XRP and Ripple. 
And none of this is, a, is to badmouth XRP or Ripple. But way back when XRP Ledger was originally created, it was designed to solve one major global problem with community banking. And that was the Nostro Vostro need for parking huge amounts of cash and collateral in order for banks, instant financial institutions, and individuals to do cross-border transfers of wealth. That was a decade or so ago. With the advent of JP Morgan's multi-currency notional pooling services, that solution no longer applies to the $3 trillion market of multinational corporations. So JP Morgan was specifically targeting the big dogs where the big money was. And they're doing very well with that. So imagine the fact that they have now solved for that $3 trillion market, their customers of multinational corporations, the problem of Nostro Vostro. That's solved for that $3 trillion market. Now let's look at what this announcement is from Citibank. And what is Citibank targeting? They're not targeting the same market. Citibank with DTCC's digital department and this new tokenization of asset is targeting private markets. So the private market has assets under management of about five to eight trillion dollars. And it's expected to increase between 13 and maybe 15 trillion globally uh, in maybe 2025 and somewhat beyond. This is a huge market. So what is a private market? And if we look at Investopedia, there's uh, a, a definition. Private markets are investments made in assets not traded on a public exchange or a stock market. These might include, for example, private equity, investments made in private companies, or private debt, when investors lend directly to borrowers where there's no market to trade on that debt. The private market is huge, much bigger than the multinationals that JPM is focusing on. So that's like a, a huge picture. Let's move that down to, to another level, a, a mortgage. Let's say uh, a family owns a uh, commercial real estate uh, building that the, all the loans are paid off, but there's equity in that building. And let's say they leverage that equity in the form of a private loan or another a private uh, transaction or contract for services that's uh, outside of that for profit. Does that gain the attention of the Securities and Exchange Commission or some larger entity? Probably not, because it's private. So these private transactions happen all the time, and banks like Citibank typically hold the paper, with the private corporate paper, things of that nature. So this is what they're trying to tokenize. And if you've been in this space for a while, you already know what tokenization means in terms of increasing liquidity, speed, et cetera. So to review JPM, J JP Morgan is addressing the multinationals $3 trillion market. Citi is targeting the private market of five to 8 trillion. Both are walled gardens. Both systems are providing banking services. Both are going to use distributed ledger technologies to do local, regional, global, geographic moves of capital, contracts, debt instruments, and tangible and intangible assets. And both will interface with other financial institutions using cash, using stable coins, using possibly CBDCs, but definitely using their notional pools of baskets of currencies. In the evolution of these systems, where would XRP fit in? It's not going to fit in directly. It's not going to ha be handling all the money, as some influencers and some advertisers have expressed. The positioning of the XRP ledger doing all the money, even with 
the advent of improved ledger code to allow clawbacks or AMMs, that ship has sailed and the technologies have moved forward. So here's where I'm going with this. In my opinion, the only way XRP can compete and survive against these giants is to become an F XRP. And that brings us back to Flare and Songbird. The Flare network adds the technological benefits of the FTSO, of truth and price discovery, of being able to enhance the collateralization and the tokenization of these walled gardens and integrate global transactions in a smoother, more transparent, more secure, and valued way. What's the ultimate end game here? We know that when F assets goes on Songbird, they'll be testing it with F BTC, F XRP, F Doge, and that will progress. I think with F assets and the addition of layer cake cross network composability, we're going to see the rapid integration of the DeFi protocols and transferring these assets between these walled gardens. And I think it's going to be competition for them. But right now, the JPMs and the city banks of the world, they're going to have a monopoly. But as the cost effectiveness of trustless transfers of digital tokenized assets in both the private and public markets, the system will be incentivized to adopt the Flare network for its superior constructs and protocol. That, that part's my opinion. But this is where I see it's going. I think that there's a train that's going down the tracks, and I believe this technology, the Flare network technology, is proving itself on a daily basis of being absolutely unstoppable. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time, and I know that Carl wants to jump in here about what's been going on with intangible assets. Yeah, we know that tangibles and intangibles are going to play a good role on a lot of these chains, and they all have that goal in mind, and that's part of their DeFi protocol ambitions. And... Who those big players are, we already know that JP Morgan is a big player. We already know they have a walled garden. We, we already know that they're always going to have customers that they're going to have. The same with BlackRock. They're always going to have these customers that don't want to touch Bitcoin. So they're going to just rely on them to handle these assets. And that's fine. But an ETF is an intangible asset. And so is a derivative. In fact, F assets are derivatives. The thing that was selling XRP and Ripple was the fact that trust was going to be something in the future that central banks won't have and they'll rely on a bridge currency in between. Right. How that evolves, who knows, really, who knows, because we haven't seen that yet. And we haven't, to be fair, we haven't seen the flare bridge or F assets. So we right. need to be objective on that front too. But I will say this, payments in the future will need the data to go side by side with the value. And that was the whole intentions and the whole point of having SWIFT and having XRP as a means to partner between central banks. But that's something that Naveen Gupta was trying to wrap his arms around. Where that ends up, who knows? I'm not going to put any any breaks on on their ambitions, but I will say that I'm a big fan of Flair and Songbird because the data and the value moves together. Right. And not just that, it's also, as you were saying, the built-in Oracle that's protecting the value of those assets as they move through time. And that's why it's the 
Flair Time Series Oracle because assets going through time have to be protected from third party and manipulation. That's why Flair is decentralized, whereas these wall gar gardens are not. Yeah. regardless if they're holding all these assets. But you got to understand, too, folks, that even if those central entities have a lot of assets, it's it's something their customers will trust, but it won't be anything anybody else will trust that's outside of that uh, cartel, so to speak. Yeah, if I, if I may, let me ask you something, Carl. Would you say that entities... Uh, traditional entities like BlackRock, Citibank, J.P. Morgan will eventually become infrastructure providers uh, in the Flare network system. Absolutely, I. It's my belief that even central banks will have to dive in because all these entities that you're describing are central authority, right? And every one of them have assets that they protect, rightfully. Because they are their assets, they're not ours, right? Mm -hmm. But there needs to be a way to connect these wall gardens so that there's fluidity between all these entities. Now, the idea was birthed by Ripple, but the forefront belongs to Flare. The market leader now, in my opinion, is Flare. Yeah, and there might be a lot of adopt and then copy, adopt and then copy. Sure, because this is open source, but, right, right. but my belief is that it's too late because Flare has already enough momentum now that just can't be copied. There's, it's just a, it's really a monster at this point because what Google is running and w with the progress that they're making with the infrastructure, it's really, I don't know, it's beyond duplication because... Yeah, I would agree um, with that. It's not just because of the $1 billion crossover of market capitalization. It's the deal with Google. It really well, it's, it, 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 Google could partner with somebody else too, that's fair to say, but all I'm saying is they've actually built out the Canary and the Flare network to the extent with these built-in protocols as, as they work together in syncrasy, that is really going to be hard to copy. It's not okay, for instance, Flare is built on the Avalanche protocol. Yeah, that was basically an open source copy. And the same with, you could make the argument between the XRPL and the XLM ecosystems. Okay. But not to get too carried away here. All I'm saying is these systems are too far along to copy at this point. Yeah. And even as some other people believe where the addition of AMMs on certain blockchains are going to add to price stability, but there's a mantra or a belief that the AMM addition to certain blockchains are cure-alls. And F the F assets are delta neutral synthetic assets. They provide a balanced exposure to changes in market value of an underlying asset without exposing itself to the changes of, of the value right. of the asset itself. And it's fair to say that the FTSO is going to be outsourced using these the other protocols, but Getting back to the original question about intangibles was really where I wanted to end up because yeah. it's really a monumental thing that it's my belief that the intangibles have no regulatory scrutiny, unlike all these jurisdictions have with hard assets. And really, in the intangible conversation, you'll find by definition, they include cryptocurrencies in that definition of intangibles. But I would argue that we have the ability to hold these items in our phone and our phone is very tangible. <laughs> so really what's happening here, and this is why the, the importance of this subject, for me anyway, is the simple fact that the definition of the intangible is actually 
being challenged. It's being challenged by decentralization and the fact that these assets can be held and maintained on the network trustlessly yep. through the Flare Networks protocol. So the, this is really a game changer when it comes to the types of monetization that it will allow people like with educational material, as you've seen with Upper Cent is rolling out. And the fact that we're looking at AI options that are going to be actually intangible, probably an AI marketplace, as Dan Rocky has suggested so brilliantly. So really, it goes back to the fact that when we talk about DTCC and the derivatives market, those players are going to want to connect to the world. They're powerful as a single entity, but they're even more powerful when they connect to everything. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, the, yeah, the functionality of clearing and settling has to go on, but it will go on seamlessly, transparently, and trustlessly when they have access to truth and data. The, the, the better definition of what they're going to need is interoperability because the broader scope of what our conversation is interoperability, and that will give these players a way to not just protect their assets, but be able to add liquidity within the infrastructure trustlessly. So now... Getting back to XRP, I'm a big fan of FXRP because of the fact that the data is going to be able to move with the asset. And that's a critical benefit for even Ripple. And I've invited David Swartz on the show. And basically what I want to know from David Swartz is how can F assets help Ripple? It's obvious to me and you and probably a lot of our listeners by now because they're big fans of Flare and they understand the Flare technology. But my question is directly to David and his organization. This seems to me that you would greatly benefit your customers if you had the Flare technology as a suite of products within what you're already selling. O ODL is fine, but ODL is in a basket of payment providers that are, they're in the dozens. There's dozens and dozens of payment solutions out there. So that market share is not something that they're going to just dominate. We all agree to that. I even heard uh, Ripple themselves admit that payments is not something that's going to be all the money. It's just not. That's right. But they're going to have a very big market share just simply because the team is very intelligent in that they have customers that rely on them. So it's all about relying on technology because most of these wall gardens, even central banks, they don't have as much of the in-house capability as we might think they have. They simply have outsourced a lot of this property, intellectual property, which is also a form of intangible asset. Yeah, and, so, and, and an FXRP brings so much more to the table. The interoperability, the security, yeah, that, the, the smart contracts ability. Yeah, because you're going to be able to send FXRP between any smart contract, any central bank. The central banks are going to have built-in smart contracts uh, on their ledgers, and they're all going to be pretty high-level ledgers. They're, they're, you're not talking about them having just side chains. No, these side chains will have the ability to have, you know, EVM built in to these DLTs. At the broader conversation of what we were originally discussing was the intangibles being a big role on Flare simply because intangibles brings on onboards a lot of liquidity. It does. Yeah. Yeah. It just does. It's and actually what's interesting about the liquidity aspect of an intangible. And if you look up the definition of an intangible, and I welcome the audience to do so, 
is you will actually see that the definition of an intangible means something of no value, actually. It, it represents goodwill, brand recognition, copyrights, patents, trademarks, trade names, and customer list. None of those things really have a value unless those internal companies plan on sharing any of that stuff. So really, that's why I'm saying here that the definition of an intangible asset is going to change. The problem with derivatives tied to tangibles such as commodities is simply the trust. And this is a huge regulatory problem for all these different jurisdictions. So that's why uh, the tangible assets, in my opinion, this is really going to be a tough nut to crack. That's why I'm saying that gold that the central banks hold, that stuff's useless. It is because the intangible real world asset has value outside of any need for regulatory compliance. You understand what I'm saying? It, it's not something that jurisdictions have to trust is accurate. There's no need for uh, an accounting because the intangible asset sits right on the chain. We'll see how this plays out. But I wanted to scratch everybody's mind with all this stuff. And Hugo's talked about it himself. He was skeptical himself about tangibles. But does he share the same position that you do about intangible growth and liquidity? In general? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because he's 100% behind upper cent in upper sense. Oh, my God. He's so far behind that. It's not funny. He supports those efforts big time and rightfully so, because the vision there is a monster. In my opinion, it's absolutely intangibles is absolutely major. And AI is going to play a big role in the growth of this intangible sector that I'm speaking of. And that's Flair's niche, as you know. Mm -mm. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, I forgot it totally about AI. Yeah. AI is their niche. That's what they're going after. And let's face it, that's Google's niche too. There's going to be a lot of things that are going to shock people in the upcoming months about what's going to be released on the AI front. Forget about F assets. Yeah. yeah I have yeah. a feeling, I have a feeling that AI is going to be a monster on Flare. Yeah, come to think of it, the last uh, week or so, I got the notice from Google that Baird is now known as Gemini, and I signed on for the upgrade so that I could experiment with it. And they give you some samples to get uh, used to how Gemini works, and it's really a great tool. So I've taken it, and I, there's all kinds of spam messages you get with your email and things like that. You can tell it, hey, search for all the spam. And tell me if you think of anything that's important based on my current mail and the people I know and my current contacts, see if I've missed anything, and then give me a summary, like an action plan or something. Boom, out it came. It was really impressive. So Gemini has a lot of uh, value in helping you to organize your life. Hey, it's great. Oh, ha. Another thing that I wanted to talk about was the deep fake. Did you see my post on deep fake? No, I didn't. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, the the, uh, the video where it's Tom Cruise or something. Deep fake is really scary because AI, whether it's going to be governments against governments or whether it's governments against us, will simply be faking us out with misinformation to manipulate us. Yeah. Or to manipulate each other, each government. And the deep fake is so scary and so real. We don't know who is actually saying what. Not just saying what. I'm saying pictures and generated with voice. It, it's really getting creepy out here, guys. So what's is Flare the solution? Is the FTSO a solution to determining that? It absolutely is, and that's my point. Because what's going to be needed here in society 
is a safe place to go for real information that's factual. And without the manipulation of external companies, governments manipulating data, okay? So this whole thing of the deep fake may just be the catalyst for flair. Oh, yeah. Hey, we sure need this. Yeah, I can see it. So AI, for those that are interested here in this conversation, believe me, it's going to be a very big thing in, in the months ahead for Flare. Excellent. I don't have too much other news. I'm hoping that we can get Indigo Flares to come on our program in a week or two and maybe have Dan Rocky back. There just is always something new every week. And One thing I want to tell the audience about Indigo Flare, he's part of the Phoenix Project. Okay, guys, he's the creator. But What's interesting, he is the first creator to bring real utility to the Songbird network. Let's make no mistake about it. There's a lot of NFT projects that are trying to cut this into a real utility thing, and they haven't done it yet. There's promise of doing that, but it's not been done yet. And FeatherSwap and the Phoenix Foundation have accomplished real utility. So for my listeners, I am no way affiliated with anybody there either. Okay. So we'll get that out there as we already spoke, but I'm just stating a factual thing that this is the first real utility built on the Songbird network. Yeah. Yeah. They got really big plans and for more development. Very exciting. Yep. Yeah, so that's about all I got. If you need to say anything more, anything else? No, I'm good. I'm good. You guys have a wonderful weekend. And thank you, William, for having me on again. Oh, hey, yeah, you know what? I think we're a winning team. I don't know. <laughs> don't tell my wife. <laughs> all right, man. Hey, you take care. Everybody take care. We'll catch you next time on Talking Flare Networks. Thank you.